All right, guys, welcome to the show. This is Ratio Podcast. I'm obviously Nicholas Sidekick uh, Petko. I'm here today with Nicola for a, a, a very anticipated conversation, to be honest. Uh, when Nicola called me and said, uh, hey, Avi agreed to do that, we were both uh, screaming like schoolgirls because uh, we're actually fans of his work and we've been looking closely at the, uh, the things that he's uh, that he's been working on, especially for the last couple of years. Uh, so we are very excited for, uh, for this conversation and I hope you guys will find it interesting as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, before we proceed, of course, the regulars, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon. And hopefully after this conversation, you will continue to do so. Uh, hi, Nicola. Can you hear me, mate? Just uh, yes. just a quick sound check. Okay. You excited, buddy? <laughs> you excited? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have really the words for it. We oh, rarely okay. get this kind of guests here, but we would love to. Hey, we come on! Love don't tell. To speak more about it. Don't don't tell Avi. Okay, we had Neil deGrasse Tyson last time, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, all right. Okay. So uh, I think Avi is here with us. Uh, uh, Avi, hi. Can you hear us, sir? Yes, I can hear you very well, and it's a great pleasure to be with you. I I was just telling my wife uh, that if my mother was alive, she passed away a few years ago, but mm. she would have been delighted to to hear that I. I'm interviewed in Bulgaria and especially in uh, Sofia, where she studied uh, at a young age. And um, uh, you know, I'm I'm fifty uh, percent. Half of my uh, genetic making is Bulgarian, so I, I'm very <laughs> pleased. Uh, and, and that's the better half, I should say. I'm very pleased <laughs> to be with you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for doing this. Uh, uh, you know, when Nicholas said that uh, uh, you know we we rarely have uh, guests uh, such as uh, such as you, he's he's sort of correct, you know, because you've been uh, you know hitting the post the podcast universe uh, you know quite a lot recently. You know, we've seen you like Joe Rogan and, and a bunch of other things. So it's uh, it's really awesome that you that you agreed agreed to do that. And um, obviously, we're looking forward uh, for the conversation. Just if you allow me, I would like to make a short introduction for our audience. Uh, so you are uh, an astrophysicist uh, from Harvard University uh, with focus on cosmology. And uh, very recently, actually, starting from, uh, let's just put a date on it, okay? So starting from 19th of October 2017, uh, you have uh, become sort of a controversial figure in the, in the world of science uh, because of the alternative views that you, uh, that you have uh, regarding an object that we are going to discuss right now. Uh, so would you, let, let me just uh, like quickly pass the ball directly to you and tell us how the story begins. Okay. So 19th right. of October. Well, mm -hmm. It's actually quite interesting because as you said, I, I worked, um, uh, on studying the universe, uh, how the first light was produced, which is the scientific version of the story of Genesis. Uh, and that's, uh, what I did um, for a decade or two. And, and then I worked on black holes, um, a very um, extensive study of various aspects of black holes, and now they are very much in vogue. I actually founded the Black Hole Initiative, which is the only center in the world that focuses on the study of black holes back in 2016. And we brought together physicists, astronomers, mathematicians, and philosophers. And, um, and the one thing I learned by studying cosmology is that we don't know a lot. Uh, for example, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. We call it dark matter for the lack of a better word. But um, uh, frankly, we have no clue as to what it's made of. And uh, when I worked on cosmology, it was uh, customary to actually propose various explanations to the dark matter and you know, try and uh, seek uh, evidence for it. And that was a very productive activity. Um, and then uh, in, as you mentioned, in October 2017, uh, the first object from outside the solar system showed up uh, near Earth. And uh, I didn't work much on uh, the solar system prior to that. And um, I was interested in this because a decade earlier, I forecasted that we shouldn't expect any rocks from other planetary systems like the solar system visiting us. Uh, simply based on what we know in the solar system, there aren't enough rocks to, f you know, that are kicked out from planetary systems uh, that we would have a chance with the observatory in Hawaii that discovered this one, pan stars, uh, to see a rock from another star. But nevertheless, it was found, and uh, of course, astronomers said that it's probably a comet, because uh, most of the 
objects in the solar system. A system are, are comets. Uh, they are just fragments. Uh, you can think of them as Lego building blocks left over from the construction project of the, of the planets. And some of them get kicked out and fill up a, a, a very large volume around the sun uh, called the Oort cloud that goes halfway to the nearest star. And it's full of these icy rocks. And it's easy to imagine that if a star passes by, it could dislodge some of these rocks into interstellar space. And therefore, we should see rocks from other s s stars that were kicked out um, over time and they are in interstellar space. And these are mostly expected to be comets because there are rocks covered with ice. So when they get close to the sun, the ice evaporates and uh, you would see a cometary tail of dust and gas surrounding the object. Uh, that's what we see for the comets in the solar system coming from the Oort cloud. And uh, the, the object was named Oumuamua because it means uh, scout in the Hawaiian language. The telescope was in Hawaii. And it was considered to be a comet, except we didn't see a cometary tail. Hmm. There was no gas or dust surrounding it, uh, and uh, in fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply around it and couldn't find any traces of carbon-based molecules. And uh, it was definitely not a comet of the type that we have seen. So then the astronomers said, okay, well, maybe it's just rock without any eyes, uh, an, as an asteroid. Uh, of in, in our solar system, asteroids are in the inner part of the solar system. They are uh, not covered with ice. And... Um, and uh, it's more difficult to kick them out because they're closer to the sun. But nevertheless, okay, maybe it's an asteroid. Um, the only issue is that as the object was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. And that meant that it has a very extreme shape. Uh, think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind such that the area that you see in front of you changes by a factor of 10. That's a big factor. Hmm. And then the best fit to the variation of light was that of a pancake-shaped object, flat, not cigar-shaped the way it's, it was in artist illustrations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Of course, when a, a piece of paper is uh, projected sideways, it looks like a cigar, but intrinsically it's flat. And that was this object was concluded to be at the 90% confidence. And then the most unusual fact about it was that it was pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force that declined inversely with distance squared. And uh, the only thing I could think of, because the rocket effect was not a possible explanation, so there was no, no evaporation of the object, the only explanation I could think of was that uh, associated with the reflection of sunlight pushing the object, um, and for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin, like a sail. Mm -hmm. uh, and nature doesn't make such objects, so I proposed in a scientific paper that maybe it's artificial. And once again, uh, just like when I practiced cosmology, studied the universe, I thought it's a completely legitimate uh, thing to do, to propose a possible explanation such that we can test it with future objects or with more data on this object. And... Um, the minute I suggested that it might be artificial in origin, the public was extremely interested, but of course my colleagues pushed back. The paper was accepted within a few days for publications. I guess the referee did not realize how much of a, a storm would be created by it. Uh, in fact, the referee even uh, s said the object looks flat. It supports your hypothesis. Um, and then... Um, a year ago, in September 2020, there was another object discovered by the same telescope, which exhibited the same qualities as Oumuamua. It was pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight and had no cometary tail. Uh, but the astronomers that discovered it within a few weeks realized that it actually, if you trace back the trajectory, it came from Earth. And it's a rocket booster that we launched, that NASA launched in 1966 in a mission to the moon. And uh, it obviously had very thin walls, and that's why it was pushed by reflecting sunlight. It had a large area for its weight. And then, uh, moreover, it had no cometary tail because it was not uh, an icy object. Uh, and so um, here is another example of an object that we know is artificial because we produced it. 
The question is, who produced Oumuamua? Hmm. And how big is it? I It's the size of a football field, roughly. It cannot be. It couldn't have been smaller than 20 meters, uh, because uh, that would be the size that you infer if it was a perfect mirror. Okay, so if it reflected all the light that falls on it, and then it couldn't have been bigger than 200 meters, because then we would see the heat emitted by it, and the Spitzer Space Telescope didn't detect any heat. We know what temperature it was heated to because we know how close it got to the sun. So the temperature that an object gets heated to depends primarily on its distance from the sun. And uh, uh, so it's uh, of, the, of the order of the size of a football field. I should say we've never launched a spacecraft that, that big. Mm -hmm. And the Pan-STARRS telescope was not, is not sensitive to objects smaller, much smaller than this size, reflecting sunlight. So it's really the first time in history that we had a telescope surveying the sky sensitive to an object the size of a football field reflecting sunlight from within the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And, you know, if you remember, there was a, a paradox raised by Enrico Fermi, a famous physicist about 70 years ago. They were talking at lunch uh, in Los Alamos about uh, the possibility of extraterrestrial uh, intelligence and other technological life. And he said, well, it's, if it's so likely, where is everybody? Mm. Now, the thing is, <laughs> in, in, this is the wrong question. The correct question to say is, how can we fund a search for things that they may have sent, you know, uh, physical objects they may have sent. Enrico Fermi didn't have a telescope like Panstar serving the sky. He had a fishing net with huge holes. You know, there is this tale about uh, a fisherman that came back from sea and said, I discovered the new law of nature. All fish are bigger than two centimeters. And then uh, someone asked him, what's the size of the holes in your fishing net? And he said, two centimeters. Right. So Enrico Fermi didn't even use a fishing net. He had huge holes in, you know, in his fishing net. And nevertheless, he asked, where is, where is everyone? Where, where is the fish? You know, and obviously we'll never catch any fish unless you use a fishing net with small enough holes. But does that, does that really mean that we actually see and follow all the objects the size of Oumuamua coming our way? Because it, yes. it's, not a big, it's not a big chunk, it's not a big object taken all the sizes of different asteroids and comets coming around. Right, uh, yes. And the reason is simple. Uh, the U.S. Congress tasked NASA to find 90% of all the objects bigger than this size. 140 meters um, uh, that have a chance of hitting the Earth. These are called near-Earth asteroids because we know that 66 million years ago, you know, the dinosaurs were very happy. They were arrogant. They thought that they controlled their dominant relative to their environment. They were eating grass. The only mistake they made is not looking up because mm. there was a giant rock the size of Manhattan Island that hit the ground and tarnished their ego trip. So we are, even though our body is much smaller than that of a dinosaur, we have the human brain. So we can build telescopes and get a warning about rocks coming our way. And that's what uh, NASA was tasked with, finding all the rocks bigger than 140 meters um, that uh, could hit the Earth. Uh, but um, with pan uh, so that's why PANSTARS was constructed. The observatory's goal was to find some of these. And the next telescope that will do that is the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile that will find about uh, 90%, uh, in, out of the 90%, about two thirds. So 60% um, of all the objects above 140 meters. And um, of course, this scale is very small compared to the size of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, um, mm. uh, which was, um, you know, uh, uh, of the order uh, of a hundred times bigger or so. Um, but uh, we want, uh, you know, if, if we want to be alarmed uh, or alerted even when a smaller object uh, comes our way because it could destroy a huge city or kill, you know, millions of people. And, um, Um, so that's the motivation for this size scale. 
Uh, and of course, what I should say is that there might be objects much smaller than that passing all the time that we are not aware of. And some of them might be artificial in origin. Yeah. So it's it's like in JAWS, we need a bigger net. Uh, you know, we need a different sort of net, you know, to uh, to examine this object. But I just want to take a step back and consider all the other, let's call them conventional theories that were postulated when it comes to Oumuamua. Which one would you say is the most, like, plausible? So you have your right, so theory, and then let's examine the alternatives. So, yeah. So that was interesting because I should say um, there was... Um, a review paper written by a, a group of astronomers after my paper was written saying Oumuamua is natural, period. But they period. wanted to establish it by authority. Mm. And uh, they said there is no, no doubt that it's natural. And then a few months later, there was a team of, um, of astronomers suggesting that maybe it's made, it was made of hydrogen because if it's uh, made of hydrogen, the when the hydrogen evaporates, it will give it a boost, just like you get the, the rocket effect on a comet, except you won't see the hydrogen. It's transparent. So they suggest maybe it's a, a chunk of frozen hydrogen. We've never seen anything like that. We don't know if nature makes it, but perhaps it's produced in molecular clouds, and this is the first one we saw. And then it's completely different from the rocks we have seen in the solar system. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a few months later, so then we wrote a paper saying, no, but actually hydrogen evaporates very easily. Uh, it wouldn't survive the journey. So then another group said, well, maybe it's a cloud of dust particles that are uh, held together very loosely, that it's a hundred times less dense than air, so that it's like a feather. When it reflects sunlight, it, it's getting pushed. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is it will not maintain its integrity because... When it gets close to the sun, it gets heated by hundreds of degrees, and uh, it's difficult to see how the material strength will hold it together. So then there was, a few months later, another uh, group that uh, argued, well, no, maybe it's a chunk of frozen nitrogen uh, chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto ex an around another star. And um, the problem with that is the mass budget. There is not enough nitrogen. If you account for all the nitrogen available in the Milky Way and make chips like that, they chip all the surfaces of Pluto-like planets, you just don't get enough chips to explain Oumuamua is one of them. So um, you, you realize, first of all, there was a statement, it's natural. Then there were all these claims of various possibilities that it will be natural. All of them argue for something that we've never seen before. OK, mm -hmm. and none of them says, oh, it's something we know about. Uh, OK, so it's something we've never seen before. We don't know if it exists. So how can you say with confidence that it's natural? It reminds me of the story of a caveman that finds a cell phone. OK, and the caveman is used to playing with rocks. So he would say, well, the cell phone is just a rock of a type that I've never seen before, which is pretty much what the mainstream in astronomy were, was saying about this object. It's natural, but of a, 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 a nature, a type that we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, if the cavemen would throw away uh, and not collect more data, more information about this object, throw it away, then that would be the end of it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if he would press a button and record his voice and then press another button, record his image, it will become clear that it's not a rock. And so my point out of experiencing what happened with Oumuamua is let's get more data. Let's yeah. uh, use uh, as much um, uh, information as we can to infer the nature of these objects. And the best way to tell is by taking a high-resolution image passing close to such an object. And you really need to pass within a 1,000 kilometers in order to... Uh, to tell uh, what the object is because it's rather small. Um, but uh, that is that was one of the mot main motivations for me to establish the Galileo project. So the idea is to send a, a spacecraft passing near such the next object that looks as weird as Oumuamua was and uh, take a close-up photograph because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book extraterrestrial that I wrote earlier this year and became a bestseller. So um, 
Now, if you ask me just to wrap up uh, what we discussed, I would say it was very surprising to me that I applied exactly the same approach as I did in the context of the nature of dark matter to an object who looks which looks so uh, weird, cannot be explained by things we have seen before. And I said, okay, well, let's get more, let's collect more data. And I got so much pushback from the scientific community uh, that was really surprising because, you know, that's the way we do science. Science is done by finding anomalies, things that do not match up with what we expected because they can teach us something new. Yeah, this raised a lot of questions about the conservative nature of science that uh, I certainly would like uh, would like to discuss here. Uh, but let's just uh, um, uh, focus our like time a little bit on on the idea of how we can collect more evidence. Because what happened here? So, so uh, the conventional theories they're they're proposing. Uh, you know, as you said, uh, you know, they're basing their claims on things that we have never seen before. Uh, but your claim is pretty much the same. We have never seen an artifact built by an alien civilization. Uh, what you did there is just postulated a theory that you hoped would be, uh, uh w- w- would get, you know, the same attention and credibility as the other alternative theories that also lack these evidence. So, okay, let's speak about the fishing net then. So what is Project Galileo and what is it uh, that you're hoping to do there? Are there any time scales? Do you have any financing? I mean, what is it? Uh, how does that look like? Right. So um, in June, um, uh, the Director of National Intelligence in the United States uh, uh, s- uh, submitted a report to Congress uh, discussing objects that the U.S. military uh, identified uh, that whose nature is unclear. Uh, it's not clear whether they are natural or y- human-made. They behave in ways that we cannot explain. And, uh, of course, uh, the public was able to see just the tip of the iceberg. There is much more data that is classified that only people with appropriate clearance w- were able to see. And... Um, very serious people were talking about it in a way that it's a serious matter. You know, uh, for example, uh, former President Barack Obama, uh, former CIA directors Brennan and Woolsey, uh, and uh, the, the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, appeared uh, in early June uh, on CNN and said that uh, he believes, you know, he, he saw the, the full iceberg when he was in the Senate as a senator. And he believes that scientists should be engaged in figuring out the nature of these objects. And here we are talking about objects in the Earth's atmosphere, not an object passing near Earth, uh, like I was discussing before in the context of Oumuamua. And by the way, Oumuamua was the first object from outside the solar system that we found. So you cannot just say, okay, it must be a rare fluke. It's not a rare fluke, it's the first one. Okay, uh, <laughs> and um, so uh, when I heard Bill Nelson say that, and he is the head of NASA, which is a scientific organization, um, I immediately um, submitted uh, a proposal to NASA and said I'm willing to make uh, your boss uh, happy and uh, engage in trying to figure out the nature of this unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP, um, and and. Um, I didn't hear back from them. But around the same time, um, a lot of people uh, visited the porch of my home. Uh, this is during the pandemic, and I hosted visitors at the porch uh, without mask. And um, some of them were wealthy individuals uh, that, who, that decided to uh, donate funds to my research uh, account at uh, Harvard University. Um, and that was a surprise to me because I didn't fundraise. They came to my porch with questions about my book and were in- inspired by the vision and decided to support my research. And uh, actually, there were lots of interesting uh, visitors to my porch, uh, including um, uh, uh, two people that uh, wanted to take a selfie with uh, uh, one of the trees that I described uh, in, in my book, uh, I, I mentioned a branch that was broken in the tree when I first arrived to my uh, house, I bought it, and uh, I was advised to break off this branch, but instead I put an insulation tape just to preserve it, and uh, 
Uh, now this is the tallest branch in the tree together with the insulation tape. And that to me a lesson, uh, an important lesson for life that um, sometimes young people are fragile. You know, they, they are insecure. They have great difficulties. And if you help them, they might become the tallest branch in the tree, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and so a couple of people that came to my porch want to take a selfie with that. Apparently, this tree is now a celebrity. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a, a YouTuber that came to my porch uh, uh, all the way from Seattle for a half an hour interview on the red eye. There, were, there was a couple, a married couple, that brought me a, a gift from their daughter, uh, a, a, a red um, oak tree plant that I planted in my backyard. Lots of interesting visitors, but most important, most consequentially, uh, was this um, uh, set of donations that established uh, a foundation that allowed me to basically start the Galileo project, which aims to figure out the nature of objects near Earth uh, and, and find out whether they are natural in origin, human-made, or something else coming from another place and uh, technological origin from another civilization. Uh, and um, we have two branches in the Galileo project. By now, there are more than 100 scientists engaged, very excited, very enthusiastic about this mission. One of them that also came to my porch said that, you know, that's the first time that he feels relieved to be able to study this subject because previously there was a lot of stigma and uh, ridicule in the scientific community, as there was a, uh, the pushback against my hypothesis, which was surprising to me. You know, I approached this very innocently. You have to understand, my, the way I do science is um, just a reflection of my childhood. As a chi I grew up on a farm, and um, I was very connected to nature. And, you know, the one vivid memory I have during dinners, you know, I would ask difficult questions, and the adults in the room would either pretend that they know the answer, uh, which and it was obvious they didn't really know the answer, <laughs> or in the worst situation, they would dismiss the question and ridicule it. And I thought that by becoming a scientist, I can continue to ask questions. I didn't change much since my childhood and try to address those questions, answer them, and be surrounded by like-minded people, other scientists. But it turns out that's not the case because even now when I'm speaking with my colleagues in academia, you know, they behave like those adults in the room, dismissing the question, ridiculing it, and not really seeking evidence to answer it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the best um, question that uh, uh, Enrico Fermi should have asked was, how do we fund the search for, for, for everybody? Not where is everybody, because where is everybody is a very presumptuous. It's like sitting at home and saying, nobody is knocking on my door, therefore I don't have neighbors. Yeah. You have to look through your window. You have to use a telescope sometime to find your neighbors. You can't just say, where is everybody? And uh, so anyway, the Galileo project is doing just that. Uh, we are aiming to build telescope systems that will look for unidentified aerial phenomena. And the first telescope system is going to be built within uh, the coming months on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory. Uh, and uh, then we will make copies of it. Uh, and we will try to get a high-resolution image of an unidentified aerial phenomenon and see what it is, uh, and track it, and see whether human-made devices could mimic its behavior, or uh, whether it's natural, or whether it's extraterrestrial technology uh, in, in origin. Um, and then there would be a separate branch of the Galileo project that would design a space mission that will uh, bring a camera very close to an object like Oumuamua, uh, I call it dating uh, the next Oumuamua because it's just like, um, you know, uh, when you are dating, uh, you have to make a decision. Um, um, you know, this, this mission would cost a billion dollars, the space mission, to send uh, a camera close to an object like it because you need to pass very close and it's very expensive uh, uh, in space. And um, so it's just like going on a date and collecting as much information as possible about the person that you go out with uh, before you decide to become a partner of that person. 
and it's like have space offspring. tender, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a big investment. If you have an offspring, you have to make sure that the partner has good genet genetic making, ha is a good companion, because uh, there is a lot of effort uh, yeah. into the um, relationship during uh, the time that you have an offspring. And in much the same way, it costs so much money to... Uh, send a camera to get close to an object, you need to make sure that it's really like Oumuamua. Oumuamua is our first love, so to speak, and it's gone by now. We cannot date it anymore. So we want to find the next Oumuamua, and we have to make sure that it's not a comet or an asteroid before we spend the billion dollars on that. So I call it dating the next Oumuamua. Hmm. And uh, that is the second branch of the Galileo project. But that that actually means that you're expecting something similar to come. How do we actually know if similar things are going to come? Because it all it, it all this start to sounds like an Arthur Clarke novel, like Rama, where we have this, uh, uh, this uh, alien artifact. Actually, it was a huge ship that came... So the humans had time to uh, make a research on it, then it passed away, but then another one came. So can we actually, do we actually have some numbers? Do we know how many of this kind of interstellar objects are entering our solar system? Yeah, so two points. First, I wanted to mention an anecdote about the name Galileo. It's derived from the northern part of Israel, the Galilee. Uh, that's the source of the name. Mm -hmm. And in Hebrew... Uh, Galilee means a cylinder. Uh -huh. So that's uh, an interesting connection between the name Galileo and Arthur C. Clarke's uh, rendezvous with Rama, which was a cylindrical object. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, um, regarding your question, I should uh, clarify that it has nothing to do with uh, the Drake equation. You see, the Drake equation traditionally was designed to describe the probability of seeing uh, a signal Uh, an electromagnetic signal from another civilization if we search for radio signals, for example. Uh, and uh, the problem with that search is that it's just like trying to have a phone conversation. You need the counterpart to be active during the time that you're looking for it. Uh, whereas what I'm describing is like archaeology, where the sender may not be alive anymore, may, may have perished. You know, the star may have died uh, a billion years ago. But that civilization sent something to space that we may find now, okay? And um, therefore, it's more like archaeology, where you find relics. Not necessarily culture. green people. <laughs> exactly. Well, not at all. I think most likely the best we can hope for are artificial intelligence systems that uh, are quite smart, but they operate, you know, not as biological creatures. Eh? Because we are using artificial intelligence to... Uh, design self-driving cars right now. They're, they're, and in the future, we'll send them to space and they will be AI astronauts, you know. And if we can imagine doing that, someone else might have done it a billion years ago because most stars formed billions of years before the sun. And uh, half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. So it's, it's quite likely that someone more sophisticated than we are already existed. So I think it will probably be equipment that we find now. You ask yourself, what is the chance, just like in the Drake equation, you want to find that the likelihood, the probability that you will see something of interest. And in this case, it's a very different uh, equation. It's basically similar to asking, you know, what's your chance of seeing a plastic bottle on the surface of the ocean? It's just, um, you know, when uh, trash uh, is sent to the, the ocean, like plastic bottles, they keep accumulating over time. And you just need to know how many bottles are there per square meter on the surface of the ocean. And then you know your chance of finding one. Mm. And uh, in much the same way, all you need to know is how many such objects are out there per unit volume. And then you know your chance of seeing them. Now, I should say it's not just a matter uh, of how many in total, because there may be a size distribution There may be many more that are small than big. We, we never launched a spacecraft as big as a football field. <laughs> we launched things that are smaller. And there might be many more things that are much smaller that we haven't noticed yet. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, these objects may move very fast. 
they may move at a fraction of the speed of light. And then astronomers would completely ignore them because astronomers in the past were looking for asteroids or comets that move at a percent of a percent of the speed of light. This is roughly the speed by which all objects move around the sun at the location of the Earth, um, uh, objects that are bound to the sun. So a percent of a percent of the speed of light. If if there was something moving a hundred times faster or a thousand times faster or at a fraction of the speed of light, the astronomers would ignore it. Uh, the, the software that identifies objects would not even recognize their existence. So there are two things here. One is the size of the object that has to be big enough for us to see the reflection of sunlight. And what we can detect right now is pretty big, you know, and there might be much smaller things. The second is the speed. We haven't had searches for smaller things. And the whole purpose of me bringing up the possibility that Oumuamua might have been a technological artifact is to encourage future research in the form of the Galileo project. And instead, what I see is a response that is pushing it back to the sidelines, dismissing it, ridiculing it, which is very strange given that, you know, for 40 years we have been searching for the nature of dark matter. And we invested hundreds of millions of dollars for specific types of particles. We tried to look for weakly interacting massive particles. We haven't found anything. 40 years. Now imagine investing hundreds of millions of dollars in the search for equipment from other civilizations for 40 for 40 years, if at the end we won't find anything, we will be at exactly the same point as the search for dark matter is right now. And that is part of the mainstream. If you ask any astronomer, they will tell you, of course, it makes a lot of sense to search for dark matter. I say it makes much more sense to search for equipment because we exist near the sun on a planet like the Earth. We know that uh, such planets are common around stars like the sun at the, the same separation. And we know that most of these stars form billions of years before the sun. So it only makes sense to search for something like we did, you know, and to me, it's a matter of common sense. And another point is, if we find that the dark matter is a weakly interacting massive particle, it will have very little impact on the daily lives of people on the future of humanity. But if we find evidence that we are not the smartest kid on the block, that will change the future of humanity. So how is it possible that modern science ignores this question when we can actually pursue it? Now, a lot of scientists say, well, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, repeating the standard that Carl Sagan first uh, mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, and I say, well, two things. First of all, I say, Extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. You know, we would not find gravitational waves unless we invested a billion dollars in the LIGO experiment. Uh, and by the way, we invested $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider, searching for supersymmetric particles. These are particles predicted by some extensions of the standard model of particle physics. We didn't find them. $10 billion, okay? And in the search for extraterrestrial equipment, we didn't even invest, you know, a percent of a percent of that. Mm -hmm. And all I'm saying is we can find a lot if we invest, let's say, $100 million in the Galileo project, which is 1% of the budget of the Large Hadron Collider. So if you don't invest extraordinary funds, obviously you will not have extraordinary evidence. So it's a circular <laughs> argument to say we don't have extraordinary evidence, therefore... We shouldn't search. All right, but Avi, okay. uh, why, why, do you, why do you think that is? I mean, obviously, the other scientists, uh, you know, they're not stupid people. They also read Arthur C. Clarke. You know, many of them are probably inspired by the, th the same things that me and you are inspired of. Uh, right. You know, these are, these are not silly people. Why do you think there is so much pushback? And just as an, uh, as an uh, you know, addition to this, uh, to this, to this question, uh, how statistically possible it is to actually have, and I, I, I know you don't know the answer, but I mean, we had events uh, here at Ratsu that were examining this question you know, by mathematicians uh, of the plausibility of having an intelligent civilization that can create such an artifact. So so combining these two, do you think that the pushback this uh, is also based on uh, this purely mathematical notion that, you know, that the, the, the chances are 
that there is no intelligent life out there, you know, uh, to, no. to, 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 an even, uh, to, to a close proximity to us, you know, because we're speaking of a light sail here, you know, right. uh, that, that we... Well, speaking. no, I, I think the pushback comes from one thing, which is our ego, okay? Uh, because when my daughters were young, they were at home, and they thought that they are the smartest in the world hmm. until we took them to the kindergarten. And sure. they would have preferred to stay at home and maintain the illusion that they are the smartest. Okay. Now, there is another element related to the ego. Uh, many of my colleagues, um, you know, dedicated decades for exploring rocks in the solar system. And they are regarded as the experts in this field, meaning they should be able to explain anything we find in the solar system. So they are used to interpreting rocks. They see something, they say it's a rock. It's a rock of a type that we've never seen before, but it's a rock. And this way they maintain their image as experts and can pretend to know much more than they actually know, which is exactly what the adults in the room did when I was a kid. And so, I so, hated so, so, that. So, so you actually, that. you actually uh, but say let, that let scientists me, would Let me know mention most. one more thing. Uh -huh. One more thing uh, related to the ego is reflected in the history of the response of the philosophers to the no uh, during the days of Galileo to the possibility that the earth moves around the sun. How did they respond? You know, even so... Galileo said, look through my telescope and, you know, maybe that will convince you that the earth moves around the sun. And they said, we know the answer. We don't need to look through your telescope. Now, why did they not want to look through the telescope? Because it was threatening to their uh, image to admit that they were wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. To say there is something out there that the reality is different than my what I previously advocated, which is that the sun moves around the earth, the earth is at the center. And moreover, having the earth at the center gives a boost to our ego. So what did they do? They didn't look through the telescope, those philosophers, those theologians. They put Galileo in house arrest, which is uh, equivalent to the cancel culture on social media nowadays. So... Um, today they would have cancelled Galileo on social media, okay, which is as bad as house arrest because basically what they wanted to prevent is for him to communicate his ideas to other people. Mm -hmm. It just uh, it just seems peculiarly odd to me that uh, you know people are ready to overlook evidence just to preserve their ego because it's in it's in the essence of the scientific endeavor to actually change your opinion based on science. So if what you're saying is true, then we have a very, very serious problem in science. And we've seen that in history. Yes, that's correct. But I would expect that we know better now. Well, uh, but you have to realize the stakes are very high on this question because this question has huge implications. And for some historic reason, um, the mainstream is... Uh, hostile to discussions on extraterrestrial uh, intelligence right now in the sense that there is no funding for it. You know, I'm a practical person. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a philosophical question, okay? Uh, obviously, the one thing we learned from four centuries ago, the experience of Galileo, is that we shouldn't listen to philosophers on questions related to reality, okay? We should look through our telescopes for the answer. By the way, that is not obvious to everyone because there was an article just half a year ago in Nature Astronomy magazine, a very prestigious magazine in astronomy, by a philosopher who said, based on philosophical reasoning, Oumuamua must be natural. Mm -hmm. A philosopher said that. And I said to myself, haven't we learned something over four centuries that we should look for the answers through our telescopes? I mean, I love philosophy. As a young kid, that was my most, uh, my biggest uh, passion, actually, philosophy. But I know that when we deal with reality, we have to collect data, information. You mm -hmm. can't just say what you, and you are wasting your time arguing one way or another based on statistics. You know, in, in the Galileo project, it's a very broad tent that I established. I included people that are strong advocates of an extraterrestrial origin for unidentified objects. And I also included skeptics. One of them is Michael Shermer. And 
he I asked him to present his view and he gave a 10 pre- a minute presentation. He is a Galileo member and uh, uh, discussed Bayesian statistics and said, you know, what's the likelihood that these unidentified objects are natural, human made or extraterrestrial? And I said to him, look, this is not a statistical question because if we have good enough evidence, if we get a high resolution image, we can tell the difference between Mm -hmm. a natural object, human-made object, or something else. And uh, therefore, that's what the Galileo Project is trying to do, move this question away from uh, statistics uh, by reducing the uncertainty, uh, Mm -hmm. okay, by getting better data. And I told him I have... um, So he said, oh, that's great. So when you have that data, I will be glad to report about it in my magazine, He's a, an editor of a magazine called Skeptic. Yeah, we are familiar with Michael. Yeah, we all have been yeah. young and so, passionate. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I told him, well, that's not a sufficient gesture as far as I'm concerned. I want you to change the name of the magazine from Skeptic to Believer. <laughs> okay, but uh, that also brings another problem here. Because obviously, uh, when it comes to... Uh, conservatism in science it's a big deal to young minds so when you when you need to 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 chase a bold idea uh you have to you need to have an influence and if you have usually people have their best ideas while they are young so if a bold person bold scientist really want to chase this idea he wants to make this a career of him of his or hers uh Isn't that a problem? I mean, the whole out view of science towards this dark karma in extraterrestrial life and searching for it, because this generally has the power to ruin careers of very bright people, because they, for example, they believe in that, they want to do more research to that, and the other people just ridicule them. Yeah, that's the biggest problem that I see, because I believe in young people, you know, I Uh, I enjoy very much working with young people because they don't have a a baggage uh, of prejudice and also they're not so attached to their ego as senior people are. You know, senior people just build these uh, echo chambers around them of young people that repeat their mantras so that their voice will be heard louder and their image will get uh, more uh, publicized and uh, eventually they'll get more honors and awards. But young people don't have that agenda. They are sort of indifferent and they are willing to take risk. Uh, and that's what I like about young people. Now, what um, this um, culture, a CD culture uh, produces is basically what you just said, the fear. And young people are afraid of uh, approaching this subject. And as a result, you know, they pursue uh, a more solid uh, ground of basically uh, not innovating and not deviating from the beaten path. Uh, you see the Galileo project uh, followed what uh, Robert Frost uh, mentioned in his uh, poem uh, that he went to the woods and saw two paths. One one of them was the road not taken. And he took that road that was not taken and that made all the difference. Now, the one thing I would add to that is when you take a road that was not taken by others, there is a great benefit because there might be low hanging fruit. And because nobody else took that road, you might pick it up. Uh, it's easy to find new things if you take a road not taken. So for young people, you know, I think it's a devastating uh, impact that, that this culture has. And that's, I think, the biggest uh, harm that it, it, it creates because um, uh, all the innovation, at least in the private sector, comes from young young people. And, um, and I, I thought that, that academia should be more open-minded than the, than the commercial sector. And uh, that's not necessarily the case. And um, so what I'm, part of my uh, mission is to try and change the intellectual landscape such that young people will be, will feel free to innovate. And a lot of people that joined the Galileo project told me privately that, that it's, um, it's the first time that they're able to speak freely and that they, they, it's refreshing for them to see that. Uh, and, you know, I can give you another example that even people that work on SETI traditionally, uh, which is a small minority of the astronomy community in total, 
very small minority, but they were focused on searching for example, for radio signals or electromagnetic signatures of other civilizations for 70 years now. Even they have uh, are opposed to discussing the possibility that unidentified aerial phenomena could be from an extraterrestrial origin. And uh, recently, just of a few months ago, there was uh, even a report written by members of that community saying that this subject should not be part of conferences where the SETI community discusses uh, astronomical evidence because it's not astronomy. And um, So this here we are, really... we are actually drawing red lines. Well, but this is completely inappropriate because let me just mention that astronomy is engaged with studying the sun, meteors that enter the Earth's atmosphere, you know, things that are relatively close to us. There is no minimum distance limit in astronomy. It's everything that is, that is studied by using telescopes. And that's what the Galileo project is trying to do. Use telescopes to collect data on objects and figure out their origin. Okay. And, and that's what I mentioned to the Harvard administration when they asked me whether the Galileo project is related to my day job. And I said, yes, because for several decades, I worked on interpreting data that was collected by telescopes. It's part of astronomy as far as it should be part of the mainstream. But what I find, which is really strange, is that the SETI community is trying to appease other, you know, people that push back on this subject. And they want to not to make them upset, and by and they do it by basically um, is, is making statements that everyone else would like, so to speak. And you know, it's the same as with social media. That when you're trying to get more likes on social media, you try to satisfy the will of other people. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't have any subscription to social media, and um, I believe it's uh, this group thing is is a big problem, especially when you're trying to innovate. And um, what I hope to do is uh, create a change in this uh, culture such that this subject will become part of the mainstream and then young people will be able to work on it because it's extremely exciting. Now, the interesting point is the public understands that, okay? The general public is extremely excited about this study and that's why my book became a bestseller translated to 25 languages. The government, the U.S. government, which is supposed to be the most conservative organization relative to academia in particular, is open-minded about it. Just last week, the U.S. Congress decided to establish a new office in government within 180 days from now, a new office that will study unidentified aerial phenomena. So they take it as a serious matter. They need to establish an office that will collect the data from all segments of governments that do not speak to each other and uh, get to the bottom of it, at least with the data that military personnel collected. So I'm saying the government, a conservative organization, taking it seriously to the point where they will have a, an office dedicated to the, to the coordination of the data assembly. They are not ridiculing it anymore. That's the biggest impact, that it's not stigmatized anymore and people will come with reports and they will be analyzed most of it will be classified, not open to the public. And I'm saying the government is more open-minded than the academic community to discuss than the SETI community. Just two months ago, the SETI community didn't want to engage to allow conferences to feature this subject. The government allows an office to be established. Mm. So how is that possible? And, you know, it may well be that some people in academia right now behave just like the church did four centuries ago. And as you say, that is extremely surprising, given mm. the fact that we are in the 21st century. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sure it's not only my experience that uh, it appears in many other scientific disciplines. And in fact, I heard from people in different disciplines mentioning that. And if you go through the history of science, you'll find many examples where subjects were ridiculed and eventually turned out to be extremely important. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a healthy process, what you just uh, described.
you know, that institutions are uh, opening to the idea of examining these these phenomena, which are obviously, as you say, of a huge interest uh, uh, to the public. Uh, in regards to academia, obviously, one needs uh, needs to be able to form a hypothesis, uh, to design an experiment, uh, to get the proper funding to uh, to conduct the experiment, and then, uh, based on the facts that they find, to make the claim that they want to make with conviction. Now, I guess one of the problems when it comes to the uh, you know, personal criticism that you're receiving is uh, the fact that, uh, you know, to some people, it's not, it's, uh, uh, to, to some people, you are already making the claim without having collected the evidence. And I'm addressing that because, uh, because I think it's important, you know, you did mention your, uh, your book, uh, you know, which, uh, which has uh, a subtitle, uh, that is making a bold, a bold claim, essentially. So just to get this out of the, out of, out of the way, are you asking a question or you are making a claim with a conviction that there are? No, I'm not making a claim with a, you can never make a, con, a claim with conviction, uh, mm-hmm. in science because the evidence is never, uh, complete, right? Right. Uh, mm-hmm. but what I'm saying is, that um, this object was the first that we discovered from outside the solar system, and it looked weird. Yes. And that's intriguing enough to collect more data on objects like it. Right. And that's the scientific process. Now, if we were to say, oh, it's probably a rock, I don't care, it's a rock of a different type, then we will relax, not collect new data on objects like sure. it, and uh, basically maintain our ignorance, which is equivalent to saying, uh, you know, what the theologians said during the days of Galileo, we don't want to look through a telescope because we know the answer in advance. And that's exactly the problem that I'm uh, trying to uh, solve by uh, establishing the Galileo project. I got funded uh, by private. You have to understand when you say an experiment needs to be funded, it's not a magic process it's sure. there are fund, <laughs> there are committees that decide which experiment to fund okay or which yep. grant to award these committees are populated by mainstream scientists the same mainstream scientists that sure. say extraordinary claims require extraordinary and they will starve the process of funding they will mm. not give funding to the search for extraordinary evidence of such equipment so it's a circular argument they would say there is no extraordinary evidence. At the same time, they would say we have other priorities. We want to figure out the nature of dark matter. We want to find supersymmetric particles. Mm. And for that, we can invest billions of dollars while not giving even a percent of that money to the search for equipment. Not yep. a percent of that money, which is the Gal- all the Galileo project needs is 1% of $10 billion. Okay, and that was never given. The Galileo project is the first scientific project. So I think it's disingenuous on the part of mainstream scientists to say, oh, the evidence is not strong enough. That's not a good subject to discuss at all. You know, we we just instead what they should do as if they are really sincere as scientists, they should say, this is intriguing. Let's dedicate, allocate a hundred million dollars to a billion dollars in the search for the nature of objects like Oumuamua, okay? Because that's a high priority item given the possibility that they might be something unusual. You know, one of the uh, colleagues of mine, after we heard a talk at uh, Harvard about Oumuamua, and he worked on rocks for decades, he said, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. Mm. which is pretty much the approach that, ex- <laughs> you know, it, it, basically for experts, they want to shove it under the rug. And the rug here is, it's natural. Okay. Mm. And that was the basis for the original review paper that I mentioned in Nature that said it's natural based on authority. And if it was obvious that it's natural, why did you need this other groups saying, oh, maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg. Maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg. Maybe it's a dust bunny. So what I'm saying is, to argue against me that the evidence is not tight enough and therefore this, this there should not be any discussion is disingenuous because all the natural proposals that were made invoke something that we've never seen before. Sure. Okay. And therefore we should leave the possibility on the table. And since it has such huge implications for the future of humanity, you know, just like Pascal's uh, uh, argument that, uh, you know, the possibility that God exists, uh, is so significant that we must consider it, okay? So the, the possibility that 
this might be a piece of equipment is has such huge implications that it makes sense to invest a billion dollars in trying to figure this out. So that's where the discussion should be. Sure. The discussion should be about investing a billion dollars rather than saying, oh, the evidence is not good enough. Sure, I would agree. Uh, yeah. Yeah, ahead, okay. I, I, would like, I would like to make a step away from politics and come back to science for a while and answer some specific questions that I'm pretty sure our audience will be really delighted to have more details on it. So when we are talking about being prepared to meet similar objects coming in the future or generally about uh, the nature of Oumuamua. So uh, how, how, do, uh, how can we really know it's a spaceship? I mean, what tools do we currently have as an instrument and the data sets, telescopes and things like that? And uh, uh, what tools do we have on our disposal that can tell us more about it? And yeah. what kind of details about the physical properties of these objects can we actually get? Like, can we have the density of it? You already mentioned the albedo. The albedo change, that means the change of reflectivity of uh, light. What else can we actually learn from looking afar? And what can we learn as we get closer to it? Yeah, so the, the best example uh, is the OSIRIS-REx uh, mission to the asteroid Bennu mm -hmm. that not only got close to asteroid Bennu, so you can see that it's a rock because uh, it had all these uh, rocks on the surface and, uh, and, and, and also some sand and so forth, but it actually landed on it and it scooped some material that it will bring back to Earth in 2023. So, uh, so that was an example for a mission that had a rendezvous with an object and landed on it. So obviously, if we can land on such an object, we can tell whether it's a nitrogen iceberg, a hydrogen iceberg, a dust bunny, where you know we will not even land, we will just go through it because it's so, so fluffy. Uh, or it has screws and bolts and some buttons on it. And I would love to press some buttons if it has them. Just like the caveman, you see, uh, you may, some people ask me, how do we tell what the technology is about if we are, if, if they are a billion years ahead of us, you know, those that produced mm -hmm. it? And the answer is just like the caveman is able to tell that it's a self, that it's not a, a rock because it will do things that look like magic to us. Okay. So we will press a button and see things. Well, we, to identify that it's a technological relic, we don't need much. You know, we just need to exclude the possibilities that it's not a rock or things that we have seen before. Okay. So uh, that is the first step to say it's not natural. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that we can do also from a distance. If, you know, instead of landing on it, if we come within a thousand kilometers and take a high resolution image, then we can tell whether it has bolts and screws on it or whether it's maybe just a rock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from a great distance, of course, the larger the distance, the less information you have. So it will be more uncertain, but we could see if the, for example, in the context of unidentified aerial phenomena where, you know, the object might be small and, you can just monitor its motion. Uh, the claim by military personnel wa was that some of these objects move in ways that we cannot reproduce. They would move, you know, very fast. Uh, and if they are real objects, uh, very huge accelerations like that cannot be mimicked by technologies that we possess. Uh, and by we, I mean humanity, not not just the U.S. And mm -hmm. so, of course. The issue, the reason it became a priority for the U.S. government is because they worry about the safety of the military, the, the, the pilots, for example, that, that uh, discovered them. Mm. Um, because, you know, there is a question of uh, national security. You know, what, what do these objects mean? Uh, I mean, if they were created by an adversary, by another nation, perhaps another nation has technologies that are far beyond what the U.S. imagines. But I, I would doubt that. Okay. Mm. Uh, perhaps it's a natural phenomenon of a type that we've never studied before. The point is they, they decided that it's sufficiently intriguing to establish a new office. And that requires a lot of funding, you see, on the government to establish a new office. 
I'm saying if the if the government is doing that, how can the academic community say, oh, the evidence is not interesting enough, even though we saw something, it may well be natural of a type that we've never seen before. And, you know, we don't invest more money in funding uh, the, the gathering of data. I think the, the correct re- response to that would have been, wow, this is intriguing, something unusual. The first object that came near the Earth from outside the solar system looks weird, okay? Uh, even if it's a nitrogen iceberg, even if it's a hydrogen iceberg, that would mean that there are nurseries that produce these objects that are very different than the solar system, okay? Let's try and figure out what the nature of this thing is. Let's build a space mission that will cost us a billion dollars and uh, find more evidence. Sure, sure. I have a... Okay, let's let's imagine it's it's an actual alien spaceship. Okay, let's imagine the Rama the Rama scenario. I mean, what would you? Okay, let's actually not imagine that. Let's uh, uh, let's think of the of the of the possibilities, and if you have any personal preference uh, preference of what these possibilities could be. I am personally extremely excited by the by the idea that there are alien civilizations out there, but at the same time, I'm horrified by it. Yeah, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, of course, you know, you as a scientist will approach uh, the subject, uh, you know, without any bias, uh, you know, without any preference. But, um, I mean, what would be your initial emotional reaction if you realize that uh, we are actually not alone? I'm not too worried about it because they had a lot of time, uh, you know, to cause damage uh, to yeah. us long before we developed our technologies. You see, the... Uh, so the fact that nothing bad happened to us implies that if they are out there and they know about us, they are not necessarily uh, planning to hurt us. Uh, you know, it's just like walking down the street when you see ants on the pavement. You don't necessarily step on them. You just mm-hmm. don't care about them. Yeah. Or if you're curious, you monitor how they, you know, what they do. But um, so it's possible that they're watching and not doing much. Um, mm. But um, I, I'm more worried about people, you know, if, if um, suppose we, we discover uh, equipment from, I'm worried about people getting engaged with this equipment and in ways that would cause this equipment for self-protection to do things. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I think the first approach that we should take is, is a peaceful one um, where we would study it uh, uh, passively. And that's pretty much what we plan to do with the Galileo project, just using telescopes, not even shining light on these objects, mm-hmm. radar systems or anything, just uh, monitoring whatever is uh, reflected off uh, from sunlight. And, um, and uh, then uh, once you identify the nature of the object, if you find that it's uh, technological in origin, then you want to see what kind of information it's seeking uh, and how does it respond to our activities. And only then we will get to the very difficult question of what to do about it. You know, that was the question that uh, uh, the citizens of Troy had to uh, debate Hmm. in the uh, Greek mythological uh, story of uh, the Trojan horse, you know, when it entered the city. And uh, of course, they made the wrong choice. It ended uh, up but, badly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think, if, you know, for example, if it's an AI system that we are facing from uh, another civilization, we will need to use our own AI system to interpret their AI system because we won't be smart enough to do it ourselves. And it's sort of like relying on our kids to interpret content that we find on the internet because they are more computer savvy than we are. Yeah. Okay. I'm afraid of uh, just just if you allow me, Nicola. I'm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, it's it's very interesting what you said that you are more worried about how humans will respond because I think it's part of human nature that when we discover something more powerful than us, uh, driven by fear, we are trying to defeat it. Like there was this like hypothesis. Uh, I, I I don't I don't know who formulated it that the the moment we realize that there is actually a god, we will instantly rebel against him, uh, or 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 something well, like that, driven by fear. Well, uh, that's not obvious because if you look mm-hmm. at religions, you know, very often uh, they they drive people to conform uh, with a set of rules because mm-hmm. of the fear of God. Okay, yeah. and that means that there is something in human psychology that uh, admires uh, a stronger entity. 
And yeah, but there was always this guy with the shotgun who is shooting at it. You know? <laughs> yeah, there's always this dude who is like, hey. yeah, yeah, that's my worry. That's exactly my worry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, okay. Nico. And uh, I was I was wondering because you opened this question up. So uh, if we ever stumble upon this kind of project, being on the Galileo network, which I really hope it will work and it will work really f- fine and it will attract a lot of uh, funding and things like that. But uh, if we actually stumble upon something like that, so will it be hidden from the general public like no. all those novels, Hollywood, blockbusters and yeah. mainstream gossip media? You see, that's that's why we established the Galileo project because previously, you know, the government owns the data that is classified because it was collected by classified uh, sensors. Mm-hmm. Uh, the goal of the Galileo project is to make the data open. Uh, it's a scientific research program where we uh, buy off-the-shelf um uh, instruments and assemble them into telescope systems. You might say, why aren't uh, astronomical observatories seeing unidentified objects? And the answer is because if a bird flies above an observatory, nobody tracks it. They ignore it. What you need is a telescope that tracks objects of interest and uh, because they move fast in the, s- in the sky in difference from sources that are very far away, the astronomical sources. And uh, you need the software, artificial intelligence, machine learning, to identify what kind of an object it is, whether it's worth our attention and so forth. That was never done in astronomy. So we are really on uh, virgin territory here. And um, so the Galileo project aims to uh, buy off-the-shelf instrumentation and put it together in uh, a new way uh, to make a new set of observatories. And then uh, the data will be open and the analysis will be transparent. Uh, so that's the way science is done, that uh, we're not hiding anything from anyone. And we would welcome other people analyzing the same data that will be public. But we will write scientific papers and submit them to journals. Now, the question is, how will the rest of the scientific community respond to that? And will these scientific papers be refereed in a fair way? Mm-hmm. Well... That's a question that remains to be answered, right? I mean, it's, uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly, you know, looking forward and excited about the project Galileo and I wish you all the success and luck, uh, when it comes to, uh, to this project because it's after SETI, this is really, uh, the first organized effort to do something about, you know, finding, specific, finding some, yeah, specific yeah, spe- research into that area. Yeah, yeah, and finding some real evidence at the, at the end because I'm 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 I have an eight year old child and he's uh, asking questions about aliens all the time and mm-hmm. it's it's always another no kind of answer you know so we just you know uh, it's it's a mental don't, exercise don't, mm-hmm. don't don't pretend to be the adult in the room just send him to become <laughs> a, a tell him to become a Galileo member when he. Uh, uh, grows, grows up, to be a team. yeah, grows <laughs> up, and I should say also that um, uh, you know the the Galileo project. Um, uh, hopefully, um, you know, will find something. We are focusing on objects, not on radio signals or other the sure. type of SETI research in, of the past. In fact, I wouldn't even call it SETI. I would say it's a search for technological relics. You know, it's mm. a very different. This was never done by a team of scientists before. Yeah. And your son could be very a very viable member of that. Uh, what, what, one of the first, he he's a fan of Indiana Jones. Now it's going to be a space version of that. You know, like a first space archaeologist. All right, that was uh, that was really fascinating, Gavi. You've been uh, very generous uh, with your time, and uh, you know, it was a, it was an awesome conversation. So, um, me and Nicola, we we thank you very much for taking the time of talking talking with us. Thanks for hosting me. It was a, a real pleasure and. Once again, I, I, I'm sure my mother would have been uh, thrilled to know that I spoke with, with you and uh, that the uh, Bulgarians will hear this interview. Yeah, and hopefully you will find the time to visit, you know, half of your home place. I don't know if that's even a thing. <laughs> uh, but but Haskovo is a nice place. It has the biggest statue of the Virgin Mary in the world, if that, if, if that is something oh, really? that's going to attract you. I yes. Yes. I'm yes. sure I will recognize a, a lot of the food the, from my childhood. I will recognize yeah. if I visit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So plenty of reasons to, uh, to visit Asavi, and hopefully you'll give us a call and we'll take you on a nice dinner. And yeah. 
we'll, we'll, we'll talk thank even you. more. So thank you, thank, thank you for doing that. Uh, all right, guys, uh, that was our conversation with uh, with Avi Lop. So check out his book. Uh, you know, continue the discussion. Do your uh, do your own research is not something that one should say in this day and age, right, Nicole? It sounds <laughs> like a, sounds like a bad idea. Uh, but uh, either way, I hope you like this conversation. And if you would like us to have uh, even more of those, uh, you can support us on this uh, on Patreon.com uh, slash Ratio BG. It's rather difficult to say that in Bulgaria. So uh, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, thank you for staying till the end. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye.